Hi, how are you guys doing today? My name is Chris Robertson and I work for Rugby Canada as a strength and conditioning coach. So today I'm going to be talking about a hamstring model. This is something that I have developed uh, over the last few years and something that I feel very confident uh, administering to any you know, team sport population. And then lastly, I'd just like to thank Martin for the opportunity to pre be able to present to you guys. So we're going to start off right away with just the importance of the hamstrings. Okay, so the importance of the hamstrings becomes apparent when we're at maximum speed running and change of direction tasks. So as we can see here on the left hand side, we have two runners. Okay, and there are, and both these runners, one here and one here, are at different uh, parts of their swing phase. The first athlete, his right leg is in the early swing phase and this is the highest uh, point possible that the thigh reaches we would call this a thigh block and then next we have Usain Bolt in the late swing phase uh, the, the leg is pre-activated and is prepared to strike the ground now what we see here is that the shank uh, the knee the knee joint goes through an extension here okay this phase right here the the terminal swing phase would be seen as uh, where the peak eccentric forces of the hamstring happen. So essentially what the hamstring does, it prevents our knee from actually hyperextending, okay? And then next we look at these change of direction tasks here, okay? The big thing that happens in change direction and the importance of the hamstrings is a hamstring prevents the femur from sliding forward, okay? And this is what prevents uh, knee injuries and things of that nature. So the hamstrings need to be very strong and robust to be able to handle these tasks. Because in team sports, we generally see one of these two things, us running linearly or doing some form of change of direction task. Next, we just talk about simply just the financial, okay? So if you have two athletes that are on max contracts that are making, uh, millions of dollars, euros, pounds, whatever it may be, and they're on injured reserve, that's actually costing the club more money. So I look at it in terms of, you know, as a strength and conditioning coach, as a high performance director, um, you know, having a good hamstring program can help really prevent and save your club a lot of money. Next, if we look at just the, the work of uh, J.B. Morin and all his colleagues, and if you are familiar with their force velocity profiling with, uh, with overground sprinting, there's a really good relationship between um, P-max and early acceleration. And again, in team sport, early acceleration and being able to accelerate quickly to top speed is a very key, is a great uh, KPI. So what ends up happening is when we do come back from any kind of hamstring injuries, our P max numbers are down. So yes, they may pass their uh, hamstring test, their hop test, um, you know, the pain test, whatever it may be. But what we've seen is actually is their uh, initial acceleration is actually down. So this is something that we want to keep in mind. And then if we look as lastly, just like the uh, availability, the best ability is availability. And we really want to be we want to have our athletes fresh as possible um, to be able to compete in games. Now, if we just go back to kind of the, the max uh, power and sprints, and we just look at the training residuals. Okay, so here's a really good uh, chart by Isrin in terms of when do we lose these qualities? Okay, so with the aerobic, the strength, glycolytic, repeat power, ability, a lactic and speed. Now, in team sport, we generally stick with these three keys, key factors of repeat power ability, the a lactic system and speed are very important. Now, if we just look at uh, the length of a hamstring injury, it could be anywhere from a one to four weeks, depending on the grade. It could be four plus, depending if it's, it's, it's severe. But if you actually look at how quickly we lose some of these qualities, so our a lactic system, our, our speed being one of the most important factors in team sport. And as you can see, it's five days plus or minus three. So if you're injured for two weeks, there's a really good chance that you're actually going to lose your speed. And if you don't have your hamstring health, how do you expect to run? So these are the things that you just need to keep in mind. 
now let's just basically just talk about the anatomy. So, you know, there's four, four hamstring muscles. Okay. Uh, we have the semitendinosus, semimembranosus, uh, the bicep femoris, which is split up into the long head and the short head. And what we see is generally is the bicep femoris, the long head or the short head, long head mostly, is what we see actually gets injured um, mostly in team sports uh, or hamstring injuries in general. So now let's just talk about how, how does this actually happen? Okay, so here's a really, really great paper and I'll link the source at the end. But it just kind of shows us what happens in the early swing phase and the late swing phase. So as we can start from the far left here is when we start our initial recovery, our leg starts to recover, our hamstring is actually inactive. And then as we go through that swing phase, okay, we go from um, active to there's a bit of slack and then the active and then we're at the end of the slack. And then actually what ends up happening is where um, our hamstrings are actually uh, overactive. This is where the eccentric uh, action of the hamstring actually happens. So if we kind of just go back, if you guys remember the picture of Usain Bolt and where he was in his uh, sprint. So you call it the, in his sorry, speed gate. Think of it just like the late casting phase or something like that, a terminal phase of his sprint. That is where we're seeing the greatest amount of peak eccentric hamstring forces. So these are the ranges that are very important. And whether you believe it's an isometric or eccentric, we just know that this is where injuries tend to happen. So now we're gonna talk about just my model here I have, okay? So I've developed a, a hamstring model that I alluded to, and it's just broken down into three distinct um, categories. So we have our proximal, which is hip dominant, distal, knee dominant, and an integrated, which is a combination of the hip and the knee. So now we're gonna talk about, we have, uh, for the proximal, we have the Romanian deadlift, okay? A very a hip dominant exercise. Then we have our next phase, we go to a GHD hip extension. So what we actually end up doing is we actually end up adding load to this. So whether they're holding dumbbells in their hands, have a barbell on their back, they're holding a plate to their chest, okay? And we just eventually just overload this hip pattern. Then we move on to the distal. So these are TRX curls. So you can do this as a Swiss ball, you can do the TRX. And what we really want to do is the end goal being we want to do it bilaterally, but you know, uh, sorry, uh, unilaterally, but that doesn't always end up happening. So we start off bilateral, get to unilateral. Okay, it just creates a little bit more forces. You can use a leg curl machine, but again, those are not really readily available in team sport environments. And then we kind of get to our gold standard, which is being the Nordic lower. Nordic lower, so we really want to control this through a full range of motion. And if you actually look at uh, her partner holding her down, it's like she's holding on to two rocket boosters. And it's not very easy to hold. So what comes really important is we're going to go back to uh, that picture of Usain Bolt, as you can see on the right, in that late terminal swing. Okay, This is where all the good stuff happens. We know that the peak eccentric forces happen here. So we really want to be able to train in those ranges of motion. And as you can see, you can control that through a full range of motion. I know there are um, things such as, you know, uh, the Nord board and things that to test um, the hamstring strength. But the issue is becoming just pricing, right? So we can just really, if we just dial it back and we just look at our coach's eye, okay? Are they able to control that through a full range of motion? Can they get to this end range here? And it very controlled. If not, maybe we regress. We do isometrics, we do uh, pauses that are in those ranges of motion to kind of help strengthen those areas. So I kind of just use this as my test. Can they do the Nordic lower? Can they? Can they not? If not, we regress and we come back to it. But usually you'll see in the progressions as I have, I talk about later, um, when we get to this part, all, of, all of my athletes can actually control it just like this. Now we're gonna go into the integrated exercises. So we have the integrated exercise are a combination of the hip and the knee, all right? So the proximal and the distal. And what we have here is a simple, just a, a Roman chair hold. And again, we load this, they hold a plate, they hold dumbbells, they put a bar on their neck, put a bar on their head or a plate on their head, I apologize. Um, 
And this is kind of how we overload it. Then we have a, uh, another integrate is the supine hip iso hold. Uh, you know, shout outs to Alex Natera, uh, working with the GWS Giants in Australia. And he has really come up with some great run specific isometrics. So I've taken this and I'm just like, okay, how do we do this? How can we put this in our environment? So again, we load this uh, bar on their hip, plate on their hip, weight belts, uh, anything to kind of weigh them down and progressively overload it. And then we move to kind of our, our holy grail, which is a, a razor curl, no return. So as you can see, it's a combination of a hip extension, right? And then a knee extension as well. And this is a kind of a staple that we see in our, our program. All, all of our athletes can, are able to actually control these ranges and control themselves through these full ranges of motion, which is really good. Now, lastly, before we kind of touch on some other aspects of the hamstring protocol, I want to talk about banded hamstring curls. Banded hamstring curls is something that I got from Louis Simmons of Westside Barbell. And what I found is by integrating these um, into our program, I kind of at, this, at the beginning of the session or as prehab, um, I've noticed it actually eliminated the pain in the back of the knee that athletes experience when doing the Nordic lower. So quick story, um, I had 14 athletes, seven athletes um, did the banded hamstring curls, seven athletes did not. The seven athletes that did the banded hamstring curls experienced no hamstring, uh, no back of the knee pain when doing the Nordic lower. And the ones that did not do the banded hamstring curls uh, experienced knee pain. So um, that was conclusive enough for me to be like, you know what, just something I always integrate into my programs. Now we just talk about the idea of sprint training. Sprint training becomes very, very important in our program for a, a few reasons and i'll tell you why so great paper here by freeman et al in 2019 that discusses where they had two groups of athletes and one did a sprint protocol and then one did a nordic eccentric hamstring strength protocol and what they found is that the athletes who did the sprinting their eccentric hamstring strength actually increased okay Another reason why is like there's a, the, that group had an increase in speed. Yeah, duh, they did it, right? The said principle, specific adaptations to impose demands. So they did more running, they got faster. The group that did not work, didn't do running, did not get faster, okay? And then lastly, just an injury protection mechanism. So you're strengthening the hamstrings in the gym and as well as on the field, court, or anything of that nature. And this is really important. Uh, to help prevent hamstring injuries and going back to those reasons, you know, such as your money, keeping your uh, financial reasons, keeping your PMAX numbers up, um, and as well as just uh, availability becomes really important. So now, last thing I'm going to talk about is essentially just a, there's our 12-week hamstring strengthening program. So bear with me, I'm just going to talk you guys through this. So first we start off with, we have our, our phase. So, so we started off with a proximal, for, and these are two week blocks, okay? Our sprint focus was acceleration. Our exercise was a Romanian deadlift, a proximal, a hip dominant exercise. And then our bands that we did, we did two times 50 reps that were bilateral. And one thing that I found is with, when you're doing the exercise is actually have variability within the week. And that's just a simple programming principle. We move on to week three and four, we move to distal, again, acceleration base, exercise was a leg curl, and we switched to uh, unilateral banded hamstring curls. Weeks five and six, we were uh, integrated, okay, acceleration focus, uh, exercise, uh, Romanian chair hold, okay, uh, and then we did 75 reps for the banded hamstring curls. Week seven and eight, we did acceleration, Okay, and we did max velocity. So the big key here is we started the max velocity work because we've built, we did six weeks of building robust hamstrings. Okay, so I felt very confident in getting them up to their max velocity speeds and something I felt very confident as we drilled their technique. Okay, and then here we did a GHG hip extension. 
and then we cap it off with 100. I find if you go over 100, there's really no point. It's something that we don't need to do. Okay, uh, weeks nine and 10, we go to a distal. Okay, and now we introduce our eccentric Nordic curl. And what I found is if they couldn't do this, then we regress them. But most of my athletes could actually do this with no issues. And again, banded hamstring curls, we did 100. And then lastly, weeks 11 and 12, we did integrated and well, was acceleration, max velocity, exercise is a razor curl, no return, and bands, we did 100 of them. And this is what it kind of culminated in. I had all of our athletes able to actually be able to complete uh, our razor curl with no return with this kind of control. I can see this one here. So we just kind of played around with it. All right, come back. Cool. And then you can see is like his partner is really having to hold his heels down. Um, so he doesn't actually end up going anywhere. And again, just using my coach's eye, these are things I just look at and I'm like, okay, you know, their hamstrings are getting stronger. They will control these ranges of motion. And And one thing we talked about is that we actually integrated this program. We actually had zero uh, hamstring injuries. And any hamstring injury we did have was a new athlete actually coming into our environment. So we're really confident in how we build our hamstrings. And that is the culmination of my presentation. So again, I'd like to thank Martin for this opportunity. Um, there's my Instagram, there's my Twitter, uh, and there's my email if anyone needs to contact me. Um, these slides will be sent out and here are my sources. If you guys have any questions, please do not hesitate to ask. Once again, thank you everyone and I appreciate your time.